Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first LCN workshop on maritime communication and security. And welcome to Daytona Beach, those of you who have flown in, which I know is a bunch of you. Um, so on behalf of the um, co-workshop organizers, I would, again, like to welcome you here. Um, so I, I just want to start with introducing everybody real quick. Um, the first organizer listed here is Jan Bauer. Here is Jan. Um, I, I, I want to give Jan appropriate credit because the whole workshop is his idea. Um, he said, hey, we should do a workshop. And I said, okay, okay, fine. And then I called Uku Clark from the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. And she said, okay, that sounds fun. And so, again, I, I thank my, my two co-organizers. Um, and, and you'll meet them more later because they get to do session sharing. But in any case, I want to do some, uh, some quick introduction. Um, I've, I've got a, a number of introductory comments I would like to make. And then I'll sort of let you know what we plan on doing for the day. So um, I've uh, been engaged one way or another with Maritime Cyber now. Um, this is probably going on um, my sixth year or something like that. And most of my research hovers around AIS, AIS spoofing and those kind of things. But over the last couple of years, um, I've been watching what is going on in the literature and the research and events out in the field. And, and I think that there's um, a number of cybersecurity challenges that I like to talk about in groups like this because many of you are or own a whole bunch of PhDs. I'm sorry, you are PhD students or you have ownership of PhD students. And there's a lot of interesting you know, research areas I think we can be looking at that in some ways are generic cyber, but in other ways are very, very specific to the maritime environment. Um, one is, one thing I like to mention is, is just the word cybersecurity. Um, I took my first computer programming class in 1973, which was 50 years ago for the arithmetic challenged, and sometimes it startles even me. And I think I um, purposefully broke into my first computer in 1975. Um, I hate the word cybersecurity. Um, back in the day, we would call it network security and computer security, and I didn't love that so much either. Uh, the reason I don't like the word cybersecurity is I think it causes us to focus on computers and communications channels and not on what we're really trying to protect, which is the information. So information security and information assurance, which were the words from the 90s and into the 2000s, not sexy, um, and nobody's going to get a dime of funding if you tell somebody you want to study information security. But I, I think we sometimes lose sight of the goal. And, and along that, I also want to say um, that it's a very common mantra in our field to say that um, people are the weakest link in security. Um, and, and yeah, it's true. People are the ones that are clicking on attachments and getting socially engineered, no matter what we tell them. Um, I, I would like to suggest, however, that people are the most misunderstood link in cybersecurity. To say that they're the weakest link is to imply that we're giving them good tools and they're misusing them. But I think the, the real state of the art is more like, I'm going to give you an automobile. The steering wheel doesn't necessarily do what you think it's going to do. And God alone only knows what happens when you press on the accelerator and the brake. And then they go off the lot and they drive the car and they get in an accident and we say, you're really a bad driver. Um, we're not, as I said, I don't think we're giving people the tools that they need to do good cybersecurity. And I, and I look at the size of the MITRE CVE database and, um, you know, point to that as, as part of my evidence. I'll come back to that in a minute. One of the other big things, of course, in maritime is uh, navigation systems, primarily GPS and the um, automatic identification system. And, and I'm not going to talk about all the issues related to I can jam them and I can spoof them. We need a lot of research on how to secure these things better um, and how to provide backup and augmentation. But um, there are a couple of areas that I think are very, very ripe for research and not necessarily just by techie types. One of them is the geopolitical implications if GPS no longer is the dominant global navigation satellite system. Um, I am not really a Russia-phobe, per se, although right now that would probably be the right thing to be. But anyway, um, I'm not, I don't walk around being a Russia-phobe or a China-phobe, but I do worry if Beidou 3 or GLONASS were the dominant global nav satellite system in the world, how would the world, how much safety would we have in the world? 
um, I, I guess we go there. And of course, the issues with global nav satellite systems, since we get so much of our timing, I observed that if I lose my GPS timing, I would not be able to use my phone to call the power company to tell them that the power was out, uh, because all those things would fail. Um, however, in AIS, uh, since, as I said, it's one of the areas that, that I spend a lot of time working on, I work on, 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 on some ideas of ways of securing AIS and also building tools to spoof AIS. And it has made me wonder if there are syndromes of AIS spoofed trajectories that we could learn at, to differentiate a spoofed trajectory from a real one, just by looking at the contents of the messages. I know that when I spoof tracks, um, there is a great deal of regularity um, and similarity in the messages that probably does not occur in nature. But furthermore, I think one of the other issues is there's a lot of research going on on how we can do track prediction based upon AIS historical information. Well, if there's enough spoof tracks in the database, is that poisoning our ability to do machine learning? Um, and so, um, you know, a couple other areas in there. This is a great group to talk about autonomy and in industry 4.0 um, because I think this group um, probably knows as well as any group the difference between digitization and digitalization and the revolution that we've seen in communications in the last 20, 30, 40 years because of our ability to not just digitize voice and digitize data and then put everything on the same network and then start to integrate applications into a single platform. I mean, in the early 60s when they developed packet switching, nobody envisioned streaming video over a packet network. In fact, they specifically said, that's not why we build packet networks. It's for data. And well, then everything became data. But my point is, today we find ourselves in an era that is frequently referred to as Industry 4.0 and we're now be able to build smart ports and smart ships and smart cargo containers. And I mean, you have to put yourself in the position of a master of a vessel who can pull up a dashboard and visually be able to understand every system on their boat from fuel consumption to the stress on a mooring line. I know where every cargo container is and the status of the cargo containers. I'm going to a berth in a port and I know the current direction, the current speed, the depth of the water, the salinity, the temperature, and be able to know all that stuff at a glance. Well, now consider the integrity of the information that I need to have to make that work. And how little of that information needs to be spoiled before I no longer can trust anything. So going back to the fact that I'm not worried about the attack on the system per se, I'm worried about the attack on the integrity, the authenticity, the availability, the utility of the information. It all goes down to the characteristic of the information, I think. Autonomy, of course, is real big in getting vessels being able to move from you know, point to point everywhere. Now, the fact that we have technology that will allow me to move a boat from one sea buoy to another anywhere in the world does not surprise me and doesn't worry me at all. What worries me is when they hit the sea buoy, now they have to get into the dock. And because that's when you start to have an infinite number of things that can go wrong. And I look at the autonomous navigation that we have. And of course, with vessels, I have to worry about the collision regulations. So there really are rules of the road. Oh, by the way, that pesky, what is it, rule six or rule eight that says something about having to have a lookout on your boat? How are you gonna do that with a crewless vessel? Well, you're gonna do that with a boatload no pun intended. You're going to do that with a whole bunch of cameras and sensors, right? Somebody has to be watching the cameras. It's naive to think that I'm going to be able to have a boat sending information to a shore ob observer somewhere, and that information can't be somehow manipulated, broken into, retrieved. I mean, I love VPNs, but VPNs can be broken as well. How are we going to deal with that in the long term? And I've read a ton of articles about autonomy and frightfully few talk about how we're securing these autonomous vessels. And my personal favorite is on workforce development. Um, as you all know, cybersecurity is increasingly a multidisciplinary field, particularly when it comes to maritime cyber. And we are frequently asking ourselves, is it easier to take a mariner and teach them something about cyber, or do I take a cyber person and teach them about how to be a mariner? 
And it can go well both ways or it can go sideways both ways. And so I, I'm going to start by observing. Um, I, I, this is a paraphrase that I actually stole from somebody else talking about cryptography. But my, my, my quote of the day is going to be, anybody who thinks that technology can solve their problems doesn't understand technology and doesn't understand their problems. This is a people problem by and large. And so we have to, you know, come up with, with workforce. Now, for about the last 13 or 14 years, and, and I, I'm already going to apologize to my computer science colleagues, um, and, and, and I do have to say that my, my academic background is mathematics and computer science. So I say this with love in my heart. We have to bring cybersecurity education away from the tyranny of the computer science department. Somehow, over the last 20, 25 years, the world has been convinced that only computer scientists understand cybersecurity. And that's why so many people want to take the cybersecurity function and shove it into the IT department. And the IT department has a lot of stuff to do in building networks, but they're not trained in securing the network. Um, it, you know, it's a different skill set. And so uh, ha ha having made that observation, I also observe that the hacker community for the last 30 plus years has been running circles around us computer scientists. I observe not only in the number of um, break-ins that we see in the news and the number of vulnerabilities that I keep finding in all these databases, but I observe that if I look at the, at the CISA reports, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency reports, about the new um, vulnerabilities they're finding in software, what are the vulnerabilities we're finding? Buffer overflows, lack of authentication, privilege escalation, um, SQL injections, command lines aren't being, you know, appropriately uh, vetted. Um, that is the same list of software problems that SANS put out in 1998. Why are we writing the same crappy code today that we wrote 25 years ago? You can't put it all up to market pressure. And so I look at that and I say, okay, well, there, there, there's some work we need to do in workforce. Not everybody in cybersecurity needs to be a code jock. What we need in cybersecurity, because it's not really about cybersecurity per se, it's about cyber defense. We need people who are curious, who know how to solve a problem, um, who are creative, who are imaginative. Um, you need to be able to think like a bad guy and yet somehow maintain a moral compass. So, okay, I understand this is a tall order. And you do have to have some tech savviness, I, I get that. Um, however, the point is we need to be looking in different places for, um, for, the, for the kind of people we need to build a defense. Which then brings me to one other thing, and that is, um, how many of you here have taken your um, annual mandatory training in the use of Microsoft Word? None of you. You're now asking, that's the dumbest question I've heard today. Well, you don't need a annual training in the use of Microsoft Word, do you? Because you use Word every day, right? So instead, we're going to give you annual mandatory one-hour cybersecurity training. And then you're going to leave the room, you're going to have lunch, and by the time you get back to your office, you're going to say, oh, crap, I've got a whole bunch of emails. Let me click on every attachment I can find. Because the shelf life of that training is ridiculous. What we need to pr create is a cyber safety culture. The maritime industry actually has a relatively good safety record Although if I look recently at all the car fires, all the electronic vehicles that seem to be causing row row fires on boats and the number of groundings we keep having, but more, more or less, we, we have a relatively uh, good safety culture. We need to have a cyber safety culture, not just in maritime, but actually everywhere, which means we have to get people who are constantly practicing good cyber hygiene. And related to that then, we also need to have good information sharing. Um, and, and this is a good segue to what our keynote speech is going to be about, because I think, um, I think the stuff that you guys are doing in, in, in the Netherlands is, is really good stuff that we need. Um, we don't share enough about vulnerabilities. Now, I, I, I've already impressed upon you that I'm old, all right? I, I know where I was on November 2nd, 1988, when the internet worm was taking the internet offline. Um, and, and the resulting information sharing we had after that. And so the last comment, though, I want to make about that is our being able to distinguish between a threat and a vulnerability. We spend an awful lot of time 
going to talks and reading papers about the threat landscape. And I will observe, yeah, the threat landscape is sort of interesting, but if I'm building a cyber defense, I can't build it around my perceived threats. Threats are external. I can't control the threat. I don't know what the threats are. And even if I knew what they were today, I can't build a defense around it. Um, anybody who builds a cyber defense and then is told the Russians are after you and they change their cyber defense probably didn't have the right cyber defense in the first place. What we need to be focusing on is where are the vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities are internal. I should be able to find and root out my vulnerabilities. And yet we have too much information sharing in this particular industry where you have to be the member of a trade group to get the information that we all need. And the problem is, I'm not worried about the Maersks of the world being able to defend themselves. I'm worried about the port of Kennewick in Washington that has a staff of eight. By the way, not all of them are in IT. Ooh, IT again. They have the responsibility for cybersecurity. So anyway, that is, that, that is, that is my, uh, that, that's my soapbox about that. So in any case, having made those opening comments, um, and I'm sure to hear responses later on during the day. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, our, our workshop. Um, our workshop actually was a very successful workshop this year at, at LCN. And um, I, I think that, that Jan and Ulko and I are all very pleased with the number of papers we got and from where they came. Um, so here are our little pie charts showing, um, th this is actually not counting papers, this is actually counting the authors. Um, of the papers. I think we had 18 or so submitted papers and nine, well, eight accepted plus the keynote, something like that? Ah, okay, 13. Okay, 13 submissions, but you can see where the authors um, were coming from. Um, Italy, punching above its weight. Thank you, Italy. Um, and, you know, you can see where, where we have the, the, the accepted papers from. Um, and so today's program, basically, we, um, I'm going to get off the stage here in a moment. Um, and we're going to have a keynote um, given by my colleagues from the Netherlands. I will let you guys give your own introductions and, um, um, and speak more about that. Um, we will go until, um, let's see, till 10 o'clock. We'll have a break. We'll have session one at 1030. Um, those four pictures there are supposed to be representative of the papers we'll have then. Uh, we will go to lunch. We will break until about 1 o'clock. We have four more papers that will take us till about 2.20. And then we have a couple of follow-up comments um, that we'll make, and, you know, that pretty much is the day. So, without too much further ado, um, you're an, I'm not even going to try to pronounce your name correctly. I, I'm, I'm going to ask that you introduce yourself, because I'm very bad with that. Steve McCombie, however, is from Australia, so I can pronounce his name. Um, that is on me and not them. So, Stephen Bjorn, why don't you guys come on up? Um, we'll get you guys started. I'll move the microphone. Oh, yes, please. Oh, there's another slide. Oop, see? There we go. There's another slide. Okay, I do, we also want to thank the Technical Program Committee. Uh, we had a bunch of people. Um, the sp speakers did not review their own papers. All right, I mean, we, 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 we really played it straight here. Um, but, we, but, but this was also indicative of you know, the, the, the reach in the industry that people were, were responding to help us out. Um, so um, we, we also do want to thank the conference for hosting us. Um, Nils is here, he's the workshop coordinator. He helped uh, you know, jockey all this around as well. So you know, thank you for that. And um, we thank you guys for being here. Uh, this is a, a, a nice crowd here in lovely Daytona Beach Shores. So did I leave anything else out? Oh, come, you have to come over here so you're going to be in the video. See what, see what happened? It's just one sentence, hello everyone. Um, so Niels is my supervisor, or was my supervisor for, for the PhD thesis. And he approached me last year in uh, in Edmonton during the conf uh, the LCN conference there, where we had this uh, radar attack paper in the maritime domain. And Niels told me, hey, Jan, um, they are going to have workshop next year in at the LCN. And yeah, could you imagine to to propose uh, or to to submit a proposal for a workshop there for the American workshop? And yeah, and yeah, sure, I could. Um, and now we are here. And uh, thank you, Niels, for the idea. 
um, yeah, and thank you, Gary thank and you. Alko, for, for doing this with me. Okay, let's swap this out. And yes. Okay, good morning. I will, Gary is a guy trying to introduce my name, but uh, I'm Jeroen Pijker, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm here with uh, Steve McCombie, and we are from uh, the NHL Stenden University of Applied Science from the Netherlands. And um, we are here to talk about uh, some of the projects of our research group, also give you some background uh, about our research group. And, um, and we'll start. This is one of our uh, buildings. It's on one of the islands of the Netherlands. It's, uh, called uh, the Maritime Institute uh, Willem Barents, and here is where we train uh, our uh, technology students, our uh, 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 students that become a captain in the future, and it's also where we have our simulators, where we do simulations uh, with uh, crews, but also with students, and uh, where we also try to do research on uh, uh, what is happening when a ship is being attacked, and practicing real cases. Now, the research group was formed in 2021, and it was uh, during COVID, and eh? you see uh, us all wearing the mask. And uh, what we want to do is, we want to do impactful uh, research into the maritime uh, transportation uh, system. So, and we have um, our colleagues of, from all kinds of discipline. One of the colleagues has a background in serious gaming, Another colleague is a maritime, uh, is a, has a background in maritime. He has been a captain for 20 years. Uh, and we have uh, um, somebody with a background in secure programming. So, and also we have some ethical hackers and uh, lecturers that teach ethical hacking. So the, the research group has a very diverse background. And uh, we are doing three major projects. That's uh, the maritime uh, incident database. We are building a honey net that is simulating a ship and we are also doing uh, simulations and training crew. So my own background, I'm already teaching for 15 years. Uh, my normal crowd is students. Uh, uh, I did that for 15 years, five days a week. And the last two years, I've been four days a week in the research group and still teaching one day because I really like uh, to work with students and I'm teaching certified ethical hacking to our students uh, that they become at the end, certified ethical hackers. I'm teaching secure programming, IoT hacking. Two weeks ago, we did um, um, we did a course with students from all our partner universities in the, in Europe, and we did a, a five-week course about IoT hacking. So they all came to the Netherlands. We visited an island with them, and then we had five-day trainings, and the rest we are doing online. And we also have a course, and that is a really an inter interesting one, I find. We have a course that's called Hack at Sea. So we have students from all kinds of different uh, backgrounds, and they come to our university, and um, we are going to have them to teach how uh, maybe to take over a ship, do penetration testing uh, on a vessel or on a port. So that's my background. Thanks, Jaren. Yeah, and... Um as Yuren was talking about, we, you know, we have a very diverse research group, but our students are quite diverse too, and it's really important uh, in, a, in getting, doing effective work, having different, have, having people with maritime background, having people with a cyber background. We were even talking before to, to Jan about um, when we did a penetration test against the ship, we actually had a, a, tr a trainee primary teacher, and she was one of the best people on the team because she actually would talk to people and find out stuff like, Whilst the, all the tech techos are trying to do stuff on their computers and not talking to anyone. So this multidisciplinary team is really important in terms of our research, both, both the academics but also the students. My background actually originally was in law enforcement and I, I got my start in, in, the, in the cyber world investigating computer crime and that was really an interesting way to come into it because you know, this is back in the 90s and we were still trying to work out how do you actually prove a case, how do you identify the offender, how do you prove the case 
you know, and we had to learn about technology ourselves. You know, we were sort of playing catch up all the time, but it was a great environment to be in because you, you know, we had a very practical result we were looking for and that get, gets you going pretty fast. From that, I moved into industry, uh, worked, actually worked a lot in the sort of financial sector. Obviously, the banks are big spenders on cybersecurity. And uh, the nice thing about working for a bank is if they're losing money, they're happy to fund you. And, and there's a very direct relationship there. It's not, it's, uh, you know, they look at the, every month, the losses. They, they, if you can reduce those losses, that's a really good result. So it's a, that's a great environment to work in. Um, then worked uh, for some, uh, for, uh, IBM and some other companies and dealing with very different threat actors in terms of who was actually coming after you. Obviously with the banks we had groups out of Russia and Ukraine were hitting us um, and that actually led me to actually write uh, my PhD in regard to those groups because uh, you, you may not know it but the first phishing attacks against banks were against the Australian banks and so it was a really sort of where they started out and uh, it's, it's a really interesting to understand how things, for one day there's no attacks and, then, and, and two months later there's you know, 20 attacks a day, uh, understanding where that actually comes from. That really drew my interest in terms of understanding more about um, threats and threat actors and we're trying to sort of build that capability within the team in the maritime sector because there's clearly a, a lack of, of security awareness and, and, and a lot of our work is around that. So. Just, I don't want to repeat what Gary said, but just some points in terms of what makes the industry so vulnerable. Really quickly, uh, ships are, are, are ageing and equipment in them is ageing aging as well. They're, they're not well maintained because of the difficulties of actually um, uh, providing support where they have to be in port. Um, there's a really <coughs> low level of cybersecurity matur maturity and there's really no cybersecurity staff to assist people. So there's, there's no... that. As Gary says, it's usually the IT people that are, that are called upon for cyber. They don't necessarily have the training. Uh, so, so it's a really tricky area in terms of the preparedness. At the same time, there's a lot of attacks that have really serious safety implications. It's not just, you know, we often talk about a, a ship as being like a factory at sea, but, but a factory at sea that can sink, and that's a real problem. You know, there's, there's a lot of issues there. And at the same time, threat actors are actually targeting the maritime sector, both state-sponsored and, and criminal groups. So, so it's, it's, it's a real live thing happening. Um, and, 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 and one of the first things we wanted to do in terms of our research was understand that sort of that environment, what attacks are actually happening. So we uh, built a database of all the cyber incidents we could find in open sources. We found about 165 dating right back to 2001. Uh, and basically, uh, about a third was involving ships, directly involving ships, and a lot involving ports. Uh, we, you know, some you know, ransomware attacks like you'd expect, uh, you know, attacks against navigation, um, all, all sorts of different styles of attack, different type of attackers, all sorts of different locations. Um, and we decided to go with sticks you know, from MITRE Corporation because we wanted to capture certain information about the incidents and so we could understand um, what, what particular bits of information we want to collect, which was going to be easily shareable. And obviously, MITRE did the hard work in terms of working out, okay, if you want to capture the, the critical things in an incident, here, here is a list. But we've worked out already in the maritime sector because there's, there's new little in, 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 um, particular things within a maritime incident that you might want to capture as well. So we're adding to that sticks methodology. So. Uh, no, not surprisingly, the incidents have gone up over time. Um, but it's interesting in terms of if you look at uh, the, the, the attacker country, uh, uh, obviously Russia's the big one. I'm not a Russia phobe either, Gary, for the record. Um, but, but I think in some ways it, it might also reflect, you know, we're obviously going for open sources. We're typically getting a lot of material from Western, Western sources. There's less reporting of perhaps attacks on Russia, you Iran and places like that who do get attacked. But having said that, it's just interesting to see, you know, it's sort of quite a various, various groups actually at the, where the either the criminal groups or state sponsored attackers are coming from. At the same time, pretty well everyone's a victim. Uh, the US is the biggest, probably not surprising, uh, but it's, it's quite diverse. Uh, as I sort of said before, there's a bit of a, a mixture amongst the, a lot of port incidents, 
a lot of vessel incidents and other ones related to other parts of the, um, the maritime sector. There's a lot of incidents involved in the energy sector, uh, wind farms, um, oil facilities and ports, uh, you know, tankers that are taking um, uh, gas and other, other, other energy sources around the world. These are obviously really critical areas right now and, and it plays into the sort of this nation state thing in ra between Ukraine and Russia, because obviously energy is all part of that, but it's also part of you know, what's going on in the Gulf with Iran and Israel and, and Saudi. But so, so there's a lot of different things playing into these incidents. Uh, and this is actually the database, so you can go online and actually have a look at it. We went with this sort of style because we figured, well, it's, it's, a, it's a global business, uh, you know, maritime cybersecurity, so we reflect that sort of in the way we show it. Uh, if you click on the things, you can actually see the details. We've also, because it doesn't actually scale well to a, to a mobile device, we've actually got a, an Android app and an iOS app as well that you can look at it on. So really we built this as a, as a uh, something for, for, for the industry, for researchers, you know, for the community, you know, to actually get the information out there. And, and it's just the starting point. We, just, we kicked it off in uh, July, July this year. It's just the starting point. There's much more we can do. Uh, but it's, it's really important in terms of setting our research in terms of, you know, we're going to be talking about the HoneyNet uh, uh, in a second, but setting all that different research up in terms of actually what's happening. So just a couple of instances I just want to pull out that just interesting in terms of why we're interested in, in running a ship honey net uh, and understanding what attacks are happening against ships. Now the, the database is great because it's historical information, but we're also interested in what, what's happening right now, what's happening on the wire, what's happening in the wild against ship, shipping systems. So what attacks are happening, what scanning is happening. Uh, this is just an example in 2017, and this was a related to, to, uh, to a, a German ship that was uh, attacked, uh, and it was a cyber attack to disable the, ship, the, the bridge using a cyber attack, and that, then pirates actually boarded the boat, or were attempting to board the boat to take it over. So, so threat actors in the physical world, real, real life pirates are using cyber in this way. So, so it's a real threat in terms of the safety of ships and also the, these types of threats. Um, there was an incident uh, in 2019 where the US Coast Guard went aboard a ship that was coming into New York Harbour because, the, again, the bridge systems had been compromised. Uh, they were really concerned. They actually stopped them coming in. Uh, th those that have any involvement with the US Coast Guard know they've actually got a really big team that actually respond to these things and they can actually fly people out. Uh, and we often talk to our Netherlands Coast Guard colleagues and they complain about how they've got no one they can fly out. So uh, they're probably sort of ahead of the game. But again, it's another example of these incidents are happening on ships, so we wanted to understand more about what this threat space is. Um, obviously, with the recent uh, uh, attacks uh, by, by Russian groups on the West, uh, there's a lot of activity also in the maritime sector. One interesting thing for us is where they're targeting particular ships. There's a particular ship that was going, uh, taking um, uh, military equipment to Ukraine but it originally came from America, and it was actually targeted by this, this Killnet, this um, uh, volunteer cyber army for Russia. They targeted this particular vessel, and actually on their, on their uh, telegram thing, they actually pointed out some detail, uh, very nicely using all the nice tools you can get to work out where ships are and where they're going, to say, let's, uh, let's go after this particular ship. So this is very much specific targeting by these, these threat groups against ships. Uh, but also, they've obviously attacked ports, and uh, this is you know quite recent that um, these same groups are targeting ports and ships for these type of attacks. So there's this crossover between the the, 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 the war on the ground in in Ukraine and this cyber attack. So we want to sort of understand more about that in terms of the impact on 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 a, sh on a ship system, but also on a crew. So one of the things we did is we actually got the Netherlands Coast Guard working with us. And we actually got them into our simulator and we simulated an attack and to see how they'd respond. Just sort of get a bit of an idea of the, you know, the potential for that type of thing. So I've got a short video. Hopefully the sound's not going to be too loud. Today we're going to um, put the Netherlands Coast Guard through uh, a realistic cyber attack on a ship using our simulator here at Tescaling. The idea of is firstly to give them an experience of what it's like having a cyber attack and having to respond to that. 
also for us to observe how they behave, how they communicate under those situations, and then when they do lose control, how they actually deal with that. So firstly, what's going to happen is there's going to be certain uh, things that don't seem to be quite right with control. The ship isn't quite going straight. They may not notice this, but eventually the actus will actually disappear and a ransomware screen will come up. And then a continuation of the incident is a, another screen comes up on, an, on another computer asking for a ransom to stop the ransomware attacking with details they need to contact. So they're trying to get out of Rotterdam Harbour, which is very busy. Engineer, this is the bridge. Can you take over the steering locally as soon as possible? Ja, dat staat erop. Dat, dat, dat zei ik al. We moeten uh, zes minuten na elf betaald hebben. So as the scenario goes on, uh, they will try to stop the ship. They'll try to put the anchor down, but they'll uh, realize that, that they haven't got control, and that's when the scenario will stop. Als manning ben je heel erg aan het vechten om de controle over je schip uh, te houden en uh, uit te zoeken wat je wel en niet kan vertrouwen. En daarin zie je dat de meldingen die je naar buiten doet, dat is sporadisch, vluchtig, snel, dat moet er even tussendoor en erbij. Die meldingen zijn dus niet volledig. En uh, als je aan de andere kant zit, dan is het dus ook een beetje gissen van wat nou eigenlijk de boodschap was die uitgezonden werd op het moment dat je dat zo heel snel naar buiten brengt. Met wat je hier doet, kunnen wij dus als kustwacht ook ons werk beter doen, omdat we beter begrijpen wat die kaptein doormaakt en wat die, die stuurman doormaakt. Dus... Uh, Wat dat betreft was het een hele leuke oefening. So yeah, so it was a great example of you know the, the level of confusion. I mean they knew that they knew exactly exactly what they're in for, but they, they came out of that simulation sweating like they really and and, and, and as uh, as Volta pointed out there, and he was he was he was basically being the captain on for, for the exercise, that the the communication back and forth was a real problem and they were realizing they're going to be on the other end of that communication in their operation center in, in Den ha in um, in uh, Den Helder in the Netherlands so so that that was really important but again it sort of shows that the the, the that confusion element's important and and the one thing i'd say is it's not just a matter of you want to do a site if you want to if you want to cause damage to a ship or you want to you know you want to cause a ship to sink or you want to do something to it you don't necessarily have to technically make that happen you just have to confuse the crew enough so that, that, that they, they lose focus on what they're doing. Now, there's a couple of incidents back in uh, 20, 2017 involving some US ships where there were actually some deaths, there were some collisions in the Pacific. And at the very start, because the, there was a, a series of them, there was a concern, oh, was it a cyber attack? Subsequently, they proved it had nothing to do with cyber, but what they actually worked out was a lot of it related to, to human factors. So basically, it was, uh, crew errors and, 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 and mistakes were made because of inexperienced crews, because you know uh, of other various things. So it's th that's the thing is that most research shows that most accidents occur because of human error. So a cyber attacker doesn't necessarily have to cause the ship to have an accident; they just have to confuse the crew. And, and if you look at in the aviation industry, how many how many aviation accidents ha happen because there's some problem with instrumentation? that confuses or distracts the crew and they and then an accident results. So the same in, in, in the maritime sector. And that's why we're really interested in looking at what attacks are happening against ships. So with that, I'll, th oh no, I'll keep going. Uh, just a little bit of introduction about, about honey nets. You probably all know what honey net is. Obviously, um, you know, great book. Um, this is the second edition about knowing your enemy. It's all about setting up a system intentionally there to be compromised. That's what it's all about. Uh, and obviously a honey, a honey net is a series of honey pot systems. Um, and the great book, Cuckoo's Egg, which has been around as long as Gary, um, it's uh, really about the first honey net, or at least the first principle of, he's, uh, the, um, uh, Clifford Stoll, he was an astronomer working in a research center and he had to run the computers uh, to, so he could actually get enough money to do his research. And uh, he worked out this attack was happening and he decided to treat it like a bit of science or study what these guys are doing. And he actually sort of effectively set up the first honey net. Um, not that long after, people like Lance Spitzner 
they set up the, the HoneyNet project and it's really about the whole idea of the system is in it being attacked. If it doesn't get attacked, then it doesn't, doesn't really help. So it's a really important principle in, in terms of that. But with that, I'll show to, throw to Yurun to talk about the project itself. One, one note, uh, w we built uh, the database. What, when we, we, I think we didn't all found all incidents yet, but in the app and in the website, there's also a form you can fill in when we missed some incident. Please give us, a, yeah. give us I mean, uh, send us the incident because... Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's the tip of the iceberg, but the nice thing about the database is we can use a real incident in terms of designing our, our honey net, but also in designing our simulation. So we're using, you know, we've got a real case. We're not, we're not making some esoteric attack up. We're actually using something that's actually real and has happened. Uh, uh, we are we are starting to build uh, build a honey net. So uh, first of all, uh, we have to come up with a design. So uh, we are setting up uh, a ship honey net, and, and the difficulty is, of course, because a ship is mostly a moving moving object. Eh? So uh, the honey nets needs to be fed with data, and then uh, we 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 need to set up a test environment. We need to do testing of the ship honey net, and. But it also, uh, we have our own students that want to, wants to become an ethical hacker, so we are in, uh, encouraging them to uh, attack the honey net, make plan, do threat modeling, and see uh, uh, when they attack it, how they come in. Uh, from that, uh, we have different phases, uh, uh, putting it out in the wild and see how it's getting attacked, maybe seeing what kind of malware is dropped on it, and uh, doing analysis of that. And further on improving it and uh, working on it. So when you look at a, a modern ship, uh, it's all kind of IT, OT. There is sometimes what discussion and what is OT, what is IT. Uh, but when we started modeling our, our honey net, it's of course, when you look at a, at a modern vessel and uh, there is a TV network, there is cargo handling, there's a cargo uh, computer. And, and when we started with our students looking at uh, how can we make a ship honey net? Uh, it's very complex to model a whole ship <laughs> at, at once. So we decided to, to focus on the integrated bridge system of a, of a ship. So uh, what you see, students from, uh, from our course, Hack at Sea, are uh, sailing. I think one of them is a former yeah, uh, Netherlands Navy. Netherlands Navy. He really knows how to, uh, how to, to work with a ship. And we are looking at the integrated bridge on our simulator. And this is where we started modeling. So uh, what we did, uh, we, made a sm uh, we made a virtual ship bridge. And um, what you already see, what is the attack point of a ship when it's sailing? It's the way in is through the internet to the gateway to the ship. So from the gateway to the ship, uh, ECHA can get into the different systems. There is an AAS system. Uh, Gary talked a little bit about it. There's an active system, there's VHF, there's a force data recorder. So the, the input for an attacker into the ship is the virtual chip bridge. So uh, when, you, when you go back to, to the slide, in the future, we maybe want to cover the whole ship, but to get a start, uh, start, start small and expand. That's our goal. So, and, um, but how do you make it attractive to an attacker? So how are we going to make the honey net an attractive approach? So we came up with some scenarios. Eh? It has to have a, <coughs> it has to be a logical, it has to be, a, it has to have a logical location. Maybe it needs to be sailing. There should be communications on the different bus systems used in, in, in the network. Uh, maybe yeah, we came up, maybe it should be sailing between uh, our harbor that uh, in the Netherlands to the island, it's between, ha just between Harlingen and uh, Terschelling. So that it really follows a logical route. But also when an attacker is attacking it, that it has some intelligence about how to respond to an attacker. Maybe it's an automated attack, then you respond uh, different than somebody is doing it manual. So we come up with a map with all kinds of options to make it attractive to possible attackers. So. Again, uh, we have a logical, hopefully, yeah. we have the entry point, uh, uh, we have the entry point to our honey net, 
And back there, there is an hypervisor that uh, runs all the different uh, Docker images and uh, is able to really sh uh, pretend to be a ship. And we show, uh, I put in this picture with the sea tail. When you go online and you look at the sea tail as uh, the gateway to the internet, you find some really vulnerabilities in the common vulnerabilities database. So there are some options, and we are going to simulate them, of course, in our, um, in our honey net that attackers really think, okay, this is this kind of common vulnerability for this and this CTEL or COPM uh, gateway. So from that, uh, and we also think, uh, we find a study from Kumar and uh, some other authors that says, okay, we have four main blocks. When you look at the honey net, you have the hypervisor. That's, uh, you have the hypervisor. From that, you have, uh, the, the hypervisor with the different images on it, if it's a uh, Docker, Portman, or something else. Uh, uh, but an attacker is coming in into um, the system and uh, maybe doing something on, on the system. And then we put it into an analyze block, and then we want to share it. So there are four main blocks in uh, the study we found. And we added a block that is called the live data provider, and that is providing the ship maybe with uh, real data sailing between uh, some location. And we are even thinking about um, sharing the position of the ship into the AAS or a professional finder and some other online platforms. And when an attacker is attacking the honey net, and we want to capture uh, uh, cyber threat intelligence and also want to share that again, maybe OpenCPI or some other kind of platform. So yeah, just some of the applications of, of the honey net. Yeah. I, we'll, I got to talk um, at uh, a session for, um, uh, there's a any, any piracy uh, operation center based in Singapore that looks after that region. There's about you know, six or seven countries involved in that. Um, and they're dealing with, with you know, normal piracy issues and they're concerned about cyber. So uh, it's just interesting when you think in terms of any piracy. Um, you know, if, if you can use a honey net, you could, you could draw pirates away from real targets. Uh, you're able to actually, actually identify their, their intelligence gathering. There's been a lot of stuff in terms of some of our incidents where um, the, uh, the, the, the pirates are actually identifying vessels, identifying uh, what, what um, what, the, the, what they're actually carrying uh, to, to work out which ship they should attack. You can, you can pick up that. Um, we can actually, we can geolocate our honey net ship wherever we like. We can change what it is at, 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 at will. Um, and, that's, and that's really important. But you might think, okay, well, if you're talking lots about this honey net ship, aren't the, aren't the, aren't the cyber attackers gonna know? And that's actually, that's actually a good thing, funnily enough, because basically if they know that there's ship honey nets out there, then when they're on a real ship, they're never quite sure whether it's a real ship or a honey net ship. So it helps in the deception. It's actually, it, it fuels the, the deception. Um, yeah, and, and the sort of stuff in terms of feeding uh, so, uh, cyber intelligence, you know, there's uh, another guys at, at Norma in Norway, they, they run a, a SOC for, for the maritime sector. We can feed information into there or or it can be fed into there and they can use that to help identify attacks that are happening, um, you know, uh, IOCs that might be useful in terms of systems that they're monitoring. Um, Cybrow, a commercial company, does some, something similar, could, you know, could do this sort of thing. And uh, Recap, this is the organisation Singapore was talking about, where they're looking at attacks on, pirate attacks on ships, information about, you know, what, what activity is going on with picking up in the honey net. Um, in a way, the, the beauty of it is that um, you know, we can build many, many honey, honey net ships. We can, we, uh, and our view is we'll, we'll build models that we'll share so others can enhance it. So we can have many, many honey net ships out there, making it much more difficult for attackers to actually try and find real ships. We'll learn more about the attackers along the way. So it's quite, quite beneficial. And just one last little thing before we stop for questions. Um, and I don't know if anybody is a John Le Carre fan, but I, I love John Le Carre and um, um, Russia House is a great, great book. And, and there was also made a nice movie out of it with, with Sean Connery. And basically the story is um, 
this, uh, the, the Sean Connery character in the movie uh, has a person approach him who's a, a nuclear researcher uh, with, the, with the, so the Soviet Union on weapons uh, and basically he has decided he wants to give the information to the West. Unfortunately, the KGB works out that he's actually, he, he's doing this and they basically uh, grab him and so what they do is they turn him so that then he says to the, um, to the intelligence people that now the, the, they're interested from the West that are interested in what he can give, I'll give us a list of what, all the things you're interested in and, 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 then, and then I can start working on that. And, and that's a classic intelligence thing where if I know what you're interested in, that tells me a lot about you, tells me about what your knowledge is, what your targets are, and that's really how a honey net works as well. If we know the, the questions the attackers are asking, that tells us a lot about those attackers and about their intentions. With that, maybe we've got, yeah, 10 minutes for questions or eight minutes for questions. Far be it from me not to honor you by asking you a question. <laughs> Shows I've been paying attention. Um, so I actually have a question not so much about the honeypots, but about the database yes. that you all have created. Sure. Um, how do you maintain currency on the database? What, what, are, your, what are your feeds? Um, do you do it by some automatic mechanism? Can people submit things? Um, I may be getting ahead of myself even no, asking okay. the question, but. No, 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 that's a good, good question. A, a combination, uh, a, a lot of it's true. So we have student groups we have working with us that you go and do good old research and they're sort of learning from that where to go to for, for various sources, various ways to do searches. Uh, you know, we're trying to do a bit of um, using AI to automate some searches to find things. Um, re really, it's when we take submissions, so we take submissions uh, through the app and through the website and, and directly. Um, so it's always a, like a, I suppose, a, you know, the tip of iceberg type scenario because obviously what's actually known publicly and what's actually happened are you know, two different things. But I think we do a pretty good job and I'm always surprised when someone says, oh, I found a new one and I go, no, nah, we've got that one. Like, so, so it's, it's often, but having said that, it's good to find new information because my classic case is with that New York uh, ship is that there was a very, that banner, very, very not, a lot of, not a lot of detail from the Coast Guard in that about actually what happened. And then sure enough, the Coast Guard commander of New York went to some conference and blabbed about all the detail and it was reported. So, so grad, over time you find out more about these incidents. It's not just a matter of when it happens you get the, you know, the basics later on. And the uh, nice thing about cyber now is government takes a big interest so there's often reports written in detail about what happened that give a lot more information. So. And it's also good to start a conversation sometimes. So we had to visit the Port Authority yeah. and we started with showing the <laughs> database and, we and we they were in it. We showed their incidents, yeah. yeah. Well, um, so, is it working? Yeah, it's working. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question regarding the honey nets you're deploying. So we have seen in non-maritime honeypots and honey nets that the sophisticated attackers try to check if they are on a simulated system or not. And if I got it right, you're running Docker containers. I think if, if I'm an attacker and I'm checking this, I should realize that I'm on a Docker container and then I may behave differently, right? If you, are you somehow trying to obfuscate that you simulate the system because? Yeah, they, you, you, that's one of the difficult points, of course, of, of building the honey net and also the risk of an attacker breaking out of the honey, neck and, yeah. honey net and then attacking your, your system. So um, um, uh, we are thinking of, of uh, simulating some, uh, all the different systems. When you look at the picture of the, of the AIS systems and the VHF and all that kind of stuff, it's communicating through uh, NMA buses, uh, one net maybe, one net is very new, but uh, not often used, but also simulating that as, as the bus systems. And that is really a challenge what we're also w working on. And, uh, and maybe yeah, we also, yeah, when we are discussing sometimes with students, we are also maybe thinking about uh, same, same, same hybrid, yeah? maybe adding in, a f in, the, in the beginning some, some real systems into it and then building it. So there are some options, but that's one of the, of the, of the risks uh, we are taking. Yeah. And it's always been a big challenge, I know, I know from, from looking at um, banking malware is you know, the anti-forensics that the, the attackers do. So they're, they're, they're actively looking for analysis. And I remember 
having one where it came in and um, you know, we got a report in as to what happened, and we knew we knew, we knew it was suspicious because it basically was asking it was it was um, uh, injecting a, 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 a a frame in, a, in a, a banking web page asking for a social security number and this was for an Australian bank. So we knew, okay, that's clearly, but we couldn't replicate it. We kept, and we worked out in the end that it only ever worked once and, and it was, it was you know, like aware of, of virtual systems and stuff. So, and that was probably, oh God, that was probably 15 years ago. So, so there's a lot of, yeah, we have to be very mindful of that. And, and, and it's, it'll, be, it'll be small steps in the start. You know, we might, we might learn a bit more about, you know, how to make it that, that sort of, you know, trick them about the virtualization we're doing, but uh, it's all part of the learning process. So, if I, if I might just follow up, yeah. are there trends that newer vessels will also use virtualization? Because we see it in other places that you have a continuization of the IoT devices or the big devices as well. So this would help, would help if you have a virtualized yeah. HoneyNet, right? But at the, mo at the current state, I think they are not virtualized, but we see the trends that in the end, everything is kind of virtualized. You have yeah. this continuization also to run AI systems and, and use them. So do you see this for ships or vessels as well? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the HoneyNet might become more like modern ships over time, like as you say, because yeah. some of these technologies, these, these techniques are used in the actual systems. Quick question, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm just wondering on how are you going now uh, to plan against, to secure, I mean, all of these vessels against zero day attacks? And especially in the era of uh, new attacks coming from federated EA, EA systems. I, is my question clear or? So you're talking about how we're gonna protect against zero day attacks? Zero day attacks, I, I mean uh, new attacks, yep. uh, which is uh, which are actually not known sure. before f uh, by your system. Yep. And the question is, the question is uh, how your systems actually are preparing uh, th the security of your yeah, vessels yeah. against well, this attack, especially when we invoke EA attacks actually, which will come, uh, I mean, in the future. Yeah. I mean, the idea is is that virtualization and, and the architecture stops them actually breaking out of it. Pl plus, if you're running if you're running an attack against a system, you're not running it I mean, unless they realize they, they they're trying to go after the virtualization. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it is it's always possible. Yeah, but but it, it's a it's a it's it, uh, I, personally I see it as a as a first, uh, we are doing a first step in it, and uh, at the discussion al already this morning with. With Jan about uh, malware for ships, and there are some companies saying there is malware for ships. But when you look on all the repositories online, like Malware Bazaar and all that kind of stuff, you don't find anything that is really specific for ships. But the companies <laughs> and the research companies are saying it, it is there. So maybe catching a first sample is already a great success, and uh, and uh, sharing that with the community and. Yeah, so steps by steps, and then maybe yeah. in the future I, AI attacks and preventing against that. So. I, I think if someone used a zero day against us, I'd be pretty happy. Yeah, because that would be a pretty amazing finding. You know, even even if our system got compromised somehow, but yeah. I, I suppose that's the challenge, isn't it? Okay. Did it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. <coughs> Coffee time, maybe. Thank you very much. I think we move to break back at 10.30.